With the character creator having come out in the game a mere handful of days away, Dragon's Dogma 2 is hyping up to be quite the launch. But what are some pitfalls you should be aware of while making your character? What sort of mechanics will the game present for those new to the franchise? In this video today, I want to talk briefly about a lot of mechanics that are coming over from Dragon's Dogma 1, and you'll want to know about them before you really get kicking, especially if you're making your character ahead of time. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. While I will be talking about a lot of topics, I think the most important one that is pertinent to now is the height and weight of your character in the creator. How heavy your character is dictates what is essentially their equipment load for those that are familiar with such things coming from the Souls series. So a very tall, jacked, higher weight character can carry more than a tiny, not so jacked, lower weight character. But... There's a trade-off. The lower weight character will recover their stamina quicker and run faster overall. The rest of the video will be me discussing things like consumables degrading over time and other things, but that's really the biggest takeaway of the entire video and probably the most important one to focus on. If that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to just head on out. Before you do, please don't forget to like, comment, or subscribe if this video helped you as that has a huge impact on my channel. If you've not yet picked up Dragon's Dogma 2 for the PC, you can use the link to my Capcom affiliated Nexus store in the comment and the description. This will get you a key directly from the developer and I get something like a 10 or 15% commission, which goes a long way towards supplying my mini Aussie's vicious treat addiction. Let's get started here on character creation and other pitfalls in Dragon's Dogma 2. Loading into the character creator, we can see my character who looks like he owns a CrossFit gym, but still, going into the detailed customization, we can take a look at what's going to happen here, right? Uh, we can go to body and we can go to height. And right now, what we want to look at right here is height. It says 96, we can drop it all the way down to 72, and now he still really, he really looks like he owns a CrossFit gym now. Um, and now all the way up to 121. And this is important, like I said, because this is what's going to dictate for your character what their carry weight is going to be. Now, that, that there's kind of two prongs to that. On one hand, what you'll be doing with a lot of stuff in Dragon's Dogma is carrying things. You'll be carrying consumables. You'll be carrying loot. You'll be carrying all these other items. And this is part of the prep that I'm going to get into in a little bit. But what's important about all that is there's no fast travel. And those items, you're gonna, it's going to take a long time for you to get back somewhere to sell them. So either yourself or your pawn or one of your pawns, you're going to want a character that can carry a good amount of items so that you can essentially stash them, sell them, whatever it is. But again, the other end of that, uh, the other prong, as it were, I was mentioning, is that with this increase to your um, weight, you also are slower your stamina recovers slower. And on top of it, your load capacity, like when we see things from Dark Souls, right? That certain percentage that kind of then dictates how slow your character goes based off of the amount of armor they have, that all comes to their weight, their encumbrance as it were. So if your character is a super big jack guy like this, you know, super high weight and everything, then this is gonna allow them to wear heavier armor and not have it slow them down as much, although they will not naturally have as high of a stamina, but they also can carry quite a bit of items. Conversely, if I were to make this character super small, and th this is just one of the easiest ways to show how to do weight. You know, I could simply I could take all these things down too and really kind of make it all as skinny as possible, right? All these things will also obviously affect your weight. And even the body type too, right? Um, having that body type be a uh, thinner character or a heavier character will affect your weight. Good lord, that looks terrifying. Look at Capri Sun with legs. But regardless, this character with that lower weight is going to have a higher stamina regeneration. They're going to be faster. They're not going to be able to carry as much, but maybe this is really good for your thief character that you want to be able to jump onto things and get really quick and in and out of combat for, per se, your, your thief or, I'm um, sorry, your pawn or yourself. And furthermore, this is also good for casters, right? If my caster has a very low weight, then their stamina regenerates quicker, and their stamina is the resource that they will use to cast their spells. Now, of course, stamina is, is going to be used for all characters, but it's one thing that sticks out definitely when it comes to characters like the mage, the magic archer, and the sorcerer. So make sure when you're creating your character, you're really keeping an eye on your weight and how it's going to possibly affect the vocations you try. Now, it's not going to have... I don't think to the point where a super damning effect, like if you're not 
super tall in the game or super small in the game, your next character is going to be completely obsolete. It's a single player narrative game, so have fun with it, right? You don't have to completely min max this, but it is something you should probably have at least a good mind for when it comes to creating your character. And keep in mind too, with your stamina being lower, that's also your stagger, right? Things can bulldoze you. You'll be able to, you'll have to deal with things a little bit more dynamically because your stamina is so much lower. So having the, the tallest character isn't maybe the absolute best thing, depending on how you're going to approach the game. It's just going to be something you're going to have to give and take based off of your needs as the player. Which then gets me into my conversation about preparing yourself when it comes to jumping in for the first time. And I think a lot of people that are coming to Dragon's Dogma are coming because they have played the Soulsborne series. And it's a different style of game. The difficulty is also kind of different. Like the things that make Dragon's Dogma difficult are kind of not the things that make Dark Souls difficult. Dark Souls, when it comes to the combat, is all about patience and not overextending yourself and learning the patterns of things and getting timing down and having skill. You know, those are all real big portions of Dark Souls. But when it comes to Dragon's Dogma, it's kind of all about the prep. It's all about what you're going to do before you range out to do any of the quests that you jump into. And I think that from reading a lot of firsthand experiences and now having jumped into Dragon's Dogma 1, a lot of people seem to struggle at the beginning of the game because they think they're jumping into this RPG where they're just going to simply, oh, we're going to go do the stuff and then we're going to come back and do whatever. There are punishing mechanics of Dragon's Dogma that, again, it's just not the same thing. Well, again, when comparing it to at least Dark Souls. But Dragon's Dogma's combat is far more about combos and flourishes because this is Capcom at the end of the day, right? So you're going to have a lot more of a dynamic style of combat, a lot more verticality, a lot more mounting things in Dark Souls. But what you are also going to have to really deal with is how to manage your consumables. Consumables will be on a timer. Maybe it's food, maybe it's health potions, whatever it is. And, you know, the, the timer is not punishing, right? It's not like three minutes or it's going to expire. It's going to be something where, wow, I've actually been playing for four hours and I didn't realize it. And, oh, crap half my stuff went bad or expired or whatever it is. And maybe you go out to go do something midday because you're not thinking of a day-night cycle and the day-night cycle for Dragon's Dogma is actually pretty punishing. Nighttime, you can't see a lot. The monsters are a lot more a lot more punishing. Oh, yeah, a lot more punishing. Uh, you have to manage your oil on your lantern. You have to do a lot of things that comes to a lot of little micromanaging and a lot of little tiny preparation again before you even go on these adventures which i think personally that kind of makes it a little bit more exciting and realistic and it kind of adds that same kind of oh i'm racing against a, a clock that i got when i was playing darkest dungeon right uh oh i'm running out of torches i really got to make sure i'm i do i really want to extend myself further and try to go do that thing i see that my pawn is pointing out or do i want to come back and sufficiently not die because this Boils down to one very important thing about Dragon's Dogma is you have a single save. Now, with that single save, it means that you are relegated to, well, obviously a single save, but that's kind of like playing Iron Man in a lot of other games, right? Where your save is just going to progress. You go through things that auto saves, you save before you leave, whatever it is, you, you die. You don't just simply go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll roll back to before I even left or whatever it was. You're just going to jump back to the last time the game saved. And that can be pretty punishing, right? If you've played a lot of older style games and the game auto saves at a point, maybe you were right before you got hit and you got auto saved. Obviously, it's not going to be that punishing, but still my point remains is that with a single save and auto saving and all those kind of features baked into the game, you're going to need to play. I don't want to say overly careful because that makes it seem like oh, you just can't have fun. <laughs> but what I'm saying more is that you just kind of have to manage what you're doing. You have to know that before you go out you have to manage these things and you can't just simply go balls to the wall and try and raw dog a bunch of griffins in the, in the wild. Even though you want to get a bunch of cool items, you can go with little limited extents outside of the town and come back or what have you, or try to pull things into town, try to do stuff to build NPC rapport and whatnot. But the bread and butter of this game is about leaving town and about going on an adventure. And that, and you don't have that, that fast travel capability, right? Once you've completed your mission, you're going to have to range all the way back. So those things, kind of keeping those things in mind when you play this game, or even before you jump into wanting to play this game, is something that you should probably know. I, I think that tempering expectations before jumping into a game that is $70, you know, keep that in mind, right? You're jumping into a $70 game, and if you don't know that, it's going to piss you off and you're not going to want to play. You're going to play two, three hours, you're going to put the game down and maybe come back to it a year, maybe never. Maybe you just return it, whatever it is. But I think that 
having this this knowledge about the game and how it kind of executes is important because what you've probably seen from Dragon's Dogma up to this point is a lot of really cool combat. And that's definitely how you're going to be playing, right? It's, you, that, that's not going to not happen. But the kind of underneath the hood of the game is also managing all these different little things. And this comes back around to your pawn. Your pawn or pawns are going to be a very integral portion of the game. And there's so much information that we've seen from people that have gone to the firsthand press events that have played the game, from the chats with the director, everything, that the pawn system is vastly improved upon the old pawn system of Dragon's Dogma 1. The way that the uh, uh, pawns talk to you in Dragon's Dogma 2 is far more helpful. They are your waypoint navigation system, essentially. But it's also going to come down to how you want to set your party up. And... One of the biggest things, too, I've kind of discovered with Dragon's Dogma is that the first one is that jumping into the game without any knowledge, I think, is going to be a lot scarier for people than, again, Dark Souls. Oh, I died. Oh, no, I'm going to restart and go die. Oh, I died again. Dragon's Dogma, I think, is going to frustrate you faster because it's not just simply, oh, I died again. It's like, oh, I don't understand why this keeps happening to me. It's going to be what's, what you're eventually going to break down to. And I think it's going to come down to understanding how your pawn plays a role in your party, how your party composition works. And I have a whole other video planned on this. I'm just going to talk about essentially party compositions and vocations and how they can kind of lean into each other. But this will be a little bit of a time sink. You're going to sit there and kind of look at, okay, if I'm going to play this character, remember you have access to all the vocations and your pawns can be basic and advanced vocations, not hybrid vocations. You just kind of want to know to yourself, okay, do I want to have the mage as my main character or is that a pawn? That's the character that's going to do the healing. I'm going to want that on board. Who's going to be the damage mitigator? Is it going to be a warrior? Is it going to be a fighter? Is it going to be a trickster who can still do damage mitigation? And all these things are going to kind of play a part of how you interact with the pawn system, how you choose your vocation, and how you kind of decide when to swap out set pawns. Now, pawns will level up every time I believe you rest. They will level up and catch up to your level. Um, and you can swap them out whenever you'd like. So you're not locked into a set pawn and go, oh no, I set up the wrong three pawns and now my whole gameplay is ruined. No, you can just swap your pawns just so you can swap your vocations at any point in the game. But it's something that maybe if you're jumping in, have a little forethought about. You know, if, if you're going through the character creator right now and like, for example, my character is an archer. So I am deciding whether I want my pawn to be a fighter and kind of be the tank or do I want my pawn to be the mage and be a healer and I'll just pull in another warrior or fighter whenever I can get another pawn online, whatever it is. But those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about now before I jump in rather than just like, okay, what do I want to play? Well, it doesn't matter what I'm going to play. I want Because I'm going to be able to work however I can around my pawns. My pawns have to work around me and their AI, right? They're not going to be as good as you are. So keep those things in mind when it comes to jumping into the game. So with all these things being said, it's, this is not a, a terribly deep dive type of video. It's, it's me more talking about some of the lessons I've learned from Dragon's Dogma after playing it over the weekend and some of the things that I've learned that are confirmed coming to game one. And that's all the stuff that we've talked about here today. Or I'm sorry, coming from game one. And I think that when I jumped in, I had a very set expectation of how the game was going to be. And it wasn't. It was a delightful surprise for me. I was like, oh, well, we're not going to play a Dark Souls game. Well, <laughs> la-di-da. But it was still one that I think is going to be jarring for some people. So that's why I want to do, be transparent with you, tell you it's not going to be like uh, Dark Souls. And you know what? I, I don't know if it's still on sale um, as of the creation of this video as I stall to type in right now if Dragon's Dogma is still on sale. Um, when I bought it, it was a, it's still on sale for $4.79. So if you want to really see if you're going to like Dragon's Dogma 2, I would encourage you to buy Dragon's Dogma 1 for $4. See if you like it. Like play like 2 hours. You're going to know real quick if you're not if you are or not going to not you if you are or are not going to like it and then decide to spend 70 bucks. I just want to be again transparent about that cuz it's like quite a bit of investment when it comes to a video game and if you're pissed off about the game, you're just not going to like it, you're going to return it and that's going to be that. So, that's my big takeaway playing through the first game and jumping into the second one here later this week is that I just think that Knowing more about how to prepare yourself and what's going to really actually matter in character creation, how your pawns are actually going to weigh into themselves, and all these mechanics that actually play way more of a part in Dragon Software than I ever thought are things that you're going to have to deal with when you jump into the game for the first time come the 22nd. 
But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any other big takeaways from Dragon's Dogma 1 that you know are coming to 2, let it be known in the comment section below. I don't have a ton of hours played in the game. So share with this as much as possible so people know what they're getting their in, their themselves into so that they can say, oh, okay, woo, oh, ooh, ah, you mean I'm not going to play Mega Man? That's not as cool. I don't want to play that. Like, you, you can't play Mega Man. Sorry. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.